What up? Good morning, everyone. So glad you guys are here this morning. Excited to, uh, to bring the word with you guys this morning. Philippians 3 is where we're going to be looking for the next few minutes. Um, last few weeks, been talking about chapter 1, chapter 2. So today we're in chapter 3, and I'm going to jump straight into it because we've got a lot of ground to cover. We're going to start at the back of chapter 3 uh, to get some context and then jump back to the front and work through it a little bit together. I'm really hoping that God today reveals through his word something to us. Um, that transforms and changes us and helps us to move forward in our relationship with him. So uh, if you would, if you would, if you're able to stand with me just to, to honor the reading of God's word together, Philippians 3, verse 18 through 20. Uh, uh, I know you just sat, but um, we're getting a little liturgical, so we'll go up and down a little bit today. I'm just kidding. Um, for, uh, for Philippians 3, 18 through 20, here's, here's where we're going to start. For many of us, of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame, with their minds set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. See, the, the context and the framing for us today, and I'm going to go into this here in the next few minutes, is our citizenship is in heaven. And Paul wants to push that into us, and I'm going to help us understand how they were thinking about this back then. But the first thing we, we have to have in our mind is that, you can underline that little, that little portion, citizens of heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. Let me pray for us. Father, we love you. And God, we thank you that your word speaks to us. God, that your word directs us. That it, God, that it refines us, that it transforms us, that it, God, it works in our hearts. Father, today we just ask for your spirit to be here. God, help us to become more like you, to put our hope and our trust, and our faith in you. We love you, and we thank you in your name. Amen. Grab a seat. Grab a seat. So there's a few, a few things to help us understand the context of this chapter, and this is one of them, and that's why I want to start here. Before we start working through the rest of Philippians 3, I want to start at the back end of it, because this phrase, citizenship in heaven, right, it carried a really heavy political context to it. And Pastor Chad talked about this a couple weeks ago, that there was a political meaning, a political undertone to this, to this phrasing. And the reason for this is because back then in Philippi, it was, it was staunchly Roman, okay? The Philippians, they, they held on tightly to their Roman citizenship and heritage. You acted Roman, you thought Roman, you believed like the Romans, you, your, your values and your ideals, they were Roman. Roman was a part of your identity, and so to stray from that, to branch from that, to do anything opposed to that was unsightly, was unacceptable, was maybe even punishable. And we see that in the book of Acts. In Acts 16, 19 through 21, what happens is Paul come, comes to uh, the city of Philippi, and upon arriving, they find a demon-possessed girl, and they cast this demon out of her. And they basically rescue and help her. And her owners, she was a slave girl, her owners get frustrated. Look at, look at what happens when, when, when this happens. Paul comes in and, and he frees this girl. And in Acts 16, 19 through 21, when her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought him before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. You see, to the Romans, property was more important than humanity. And, and, so, and so to make a decision that valued someone's humanity over my own property was un-Roman. That, that, was, that was pushing up against the culture and the values of that time. And so, and so what we see here is the reason that Paul gets apprehended so quickly is because he violated, he violated the cultural norms and the cultural identity of the Romans. Look at, like, if you put that back up there, or if you look in, in there, you see, they point to, what do they point to? He's a Jew, and he's not acting like a Roman. And he is infringing on the Roman identity and practices and norms. See, the reason that it was such an issue, what Paul was doing, was, was because he was pushing up against the Roman identity, and that was the chief thing that they walked with. And so we have to understand that. Why is that important for us? Because Paul's writing a letter to people who were converts in Philippi. And so they grew up with, and their entire uh, heritage was Roman. They grew up with this idea that I am Roman first. They grew up with this idea that, that everything I have, everything that I value, my identity is wrapped up into this Roman nation. 
And so when Paul's writing to them, they're, they're already reading his passage, his scripture, his writings. They're reading it with this mindset. And they're battling with this thing that Paul's going to bring out to them. Because, because Paul is pushing up against this identity and this ideal. And, 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 and that was an issue for them. Because, man, to stand out then was, like we said, it's punishable. It was disgraceful. It was something that you weren't supposed to do. And so, and so Paul wants us to understand something here is that, that you're a citizen of heaven first. That's, that's, that's why he brings us in there. You're a citizen of heaven first. He's, he's holding up the citizenship of Rome and he's holding up the citizenship of heaven and he's saying one has to come above the other. See, the reason that I know it was such a, like what Paul did was such a big deal was because they didn't even ask him if he was Roman. If you look back through it, like later on, he reveals that, hey, I'm actually, I'm, I'm actually a Roman citizen. And they freak out. They, they, they're, they're alarmed and terrified. What that tells me is, is the reason that they were so quick to, to, to make the move on him is because they thought no Roman would ever act that way. No, no, no Roman citizen would ever think or believe and value humanity over property. No one would ever make that type of decision. And so we see, we see the world that this letter was written in, that this Roman identity was paramount. It was everything. It was, it was how they lived their life. It dictated and directed almost every part of their decision-making process. And Paul is trying to bring that to the surface for us today, to remind them that they're heavenly citizens. And so as we look into this chapter, what's going to happen is Paul is, going to, Paul is calling them, to release certain things, to embrace certain things, to live a certain way, and it's going to be difficult because it's going to come up against this old way of thinking, these old ideas, this heritage, this identity. This, he's, he's basically saying, listen, like I'm going to bring some things to you that are true of a citizen of heaven, and you know what? Sometimes they're going to be at odds with being a citizen of Rome, and you've got to make a decision about which one is the highest priority, and it's true for us today too. See, this is why I want to frame this for us, because Paul, in the same way he writes to that culture, right, the Word of God is living and active, and, and it continues to, to, to speak to us. And so in every culture through time, right, every, every nation and every group and every people has had to figure out what are the things that I'm battling up against in my culture, and it's true for us today in America. Like, the same way that Paul is holding up the Romans' citizenship, he's holding up the American citizenship to say, man, you're, you're an American, sure, but you're also a Christian, and one of those has to come first. One of those, one of those is priority over the other. And that's how, this is how they would have understood this writing to Paul is to say, one of these has to stand on top of the other one. And so today, that's how we have to frame our mind a little bit. And so we have to look inward, and that's what we're going to do, is look at this together to see, what is Paul trying to bring out? What is Paul trying to say to us? That is the tension and is the battle, and that he's trying to elevate the citizen, citizenship of heaven over. And so the question I want to frame all of this in, with this understanding of how they would have read this, is this simple question. What do you hope in? That's where I want to start today. What do you hope in? Because all of us hope in something. All of us put our trust in something. All of us put our faith in something. And maybe a lot of us would say our answer to this is Jesus or the church or God or, or you know, faith, uh, you know, righteousness through Christ. But I really want to dig into this and push on this idea. What do I really hope in? Because that's, that's the crux of Paul's message through chapter 3. Where is our hope, really? So let's jump into Scripture. Verse, verse number 1 out of Philippians 3. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. See here, Paul brings to light, this is an early battle that the church had because you had Jews who were converting to Christianity and they were bringing with them all their old ways of thinking, all their old ways of living, their obedience to Old Testament laws and, uh, and uh, rituals and all this type of stuff, right? And so now they're getting converted and it was essential. Listen, just like the Romans had essential parts, like I'm Roman, that's my identity, Jews, Jews that, fought, that were you know, religious and ritualistic, that was part of their identity as well. 
And so now they're stepping into this, and all of a sudden, like, they're stepping into life in Christ, and, and they're bringing this old idea into it as well. And what's happening is Gentiles are converting over to Christianity for the first time. you got Jews and Gentiles coming into the same family, the same tree. And so Jews begin to put the same ways of living onto these new Christians, Okay? And, and these Gentiles, remember, remember, they're Romans. Like, so they're coming in, and they're trying to deal with this old identity that they had as Romans, and now they've got these new Jewish Christians who are telling them, no, you've got to do this, do this thing, you've got to live this way, you've got to act this way in order to be accepted by God. They were putting conditions on acceptance by God, and that was an issue for Paul. And so that's why he starts to dig into this. And, and what we see early on in this, look, he talks about it. He says, he says, look out for those who mutilate the flesh, for we are the circumcision. He's talking about circumcision because that was the thing that they were pushing on. For some reason, in the early church, this was, a, this, was, this was one of the heated debates. It's a terrible church growth strategy, right? Like, if you're going to come to the church, you've got to get circumcised. Welcome, you know? I mean, <laughs> like, imagine that in grow track, right? We're going we're to help you know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and get circumcised. Right? Like, I mean, that's just, <laughs> like, someone new walking through, like, hey, what's that room over there? Like, yeah, we're just, we'll, we'll take a few weeks before we show you that room. <laughs> You're still a little more comfortable with us. <clears throat> um, you have a problem with knives. Um, so uh, it's terrible. It's terrible. I mean, it's, it's, it's weird, but that's, that's, that's what it was. There, there was certain things that they were trying to put their hope and their faith and their trust in. They were trying to bring that into this new life in Christ, trying to bring all this old way of living into this new identity in Christ. And so Paul, what he says, he says, look, he says, we put no confidence in the flesh. We put no confidence in the flesh because the flesh is temporary. These men were relying on their own morality. These early Jews, these early Jewish Christians, Judaizers, uh, they, they were relying on their own morality, their own ability to be obedient, their own, their own um, adherence to these laws, basically to say this is how we continue to commune and to have a relationship with God is by, by following all these old ways. And so they were dragging this old identity, all this baggage from their history into their new life in Christ. And Paul says this is an issue. He says it's an issue. And the problem that I think many of us have today is that we hope in the temporary. See, this is why I ask you, what are you hoping? Because I want to show you that oftentimes I hope in the temporary. Oftentimes I put my faith and my trust in flesh things. And that maybe you do too. That maybe sometimes on the inside when, when you're thinking about or when you're dealing with Whatever issue you're facing, you put your hope in temporary things. And maybe, we, maybe when if I ask you, what are you hoping, you've never verbalized that. But the inside of our life shows something different. And so that's, that's, what I, that's what Paul's saying to us is, listen, you should not put your trust and your hope in temporary things. You should not put your hope in your ability to attain good. You shouldn't put your hope in the systems of this world or the heritage of your past. You shouldn't put your hope in the values that you bring into this thing. You shouldn't put your hope into anything else besides the, the, the blood and the work and, and the love of Jesus Christ. Because everything else is temporary. Everything else is temporary. And the problem is that we continue to hope and look to, to temporary things. And so Paul shows us kind of what it looks like. Let me, let me, let me show you through Scripture well, how, how Paul shows us that we look to temporary things. In verse 4, he goes on, Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under, under the law, blameless. Paul has an incredible pedigree. He, he has all this stuff. Now, why would he rattle all this stuff off, right? Like, like think about it. Why, like, why is, why is he bragging on all of his incredible accomplishments? Like, who likes that guy, right? Like, like who likes the one-upper? Like, you know, oh, yeah, hey, check it out. I got, yeah, I got, you got a new truck. Oh, I got three of those, you know. Oh, man, yeah, friends are over. We're watching the game on the big screen. What is it? Oh, it's a 55-inch. I've got a 92, you know. Like, what? Maybe like the passive-aggressive one-upper, you know. Oh, you went with the base model. Mm. <laughs> Who likes it? No one likes a one-upper. That's not what Paul's doing here. Paul's, Paul's bringing all of this to the service for us to understand the way that we hope in things. He's trying to show us because he used to do the same thing. Paul was a lot like you and me. Paul was a lot like you and I. Like, like Paul, he was, he was driven by accomplishment. 
Paul was the ultimate achiever. Paul would have fit in really well in the American system today. Because his whole life up before Christ was all about the things that he could have, the education he could get, right? Doing good, working harder, controlling his future. Paul did all of those things to get to a place with God so that he could have a good and successful life. And that's how he used to measure these things. And then one day it became true to him that, like, like listen, like, this is not actually what I can put my hope in. And so, so he brings these ideas. He's bringing this up because he's saying, listen, like, I, I brought all of this to, to my walk with God and I had to deal with it. I brought all these ideas, all these things that I had, all the values that I held, I had to deal with it. And, and he says that to us because the truth is, is that we have that same issue. We bring all of our stuff into our relationship with God. We bring our heritage. We bring our past. We bring our American culture into our walk with God. Every culture does. Like every person in every culture brings their culture into their relationship with God. So the reason I'm talking about American ones is because we live in America. Before you get too upset, okay? But, but listen, listen. You're, and you're going to want to push against this a little bit. Like a, as an American... You're going to want to resist it a little bit. You're going to want to try and say, well, I've got some rights and I've got some freedoms and, and, and you know, I've got some ideals and they're based in this or they're stood on that. Well, listen, all I'm asking you to do is, is to say, what are we placing first? What, what are we elevating above the other? Just as Paul asked them, are you elevating the Roman citizenship or are you elevating citizenship of heaven? Are you elevating the Jewish Christian heritage or are you elevating the citizenship of heaven? Are you elevating American citizenship and ideals and values and culture? Are you elevating citizenship of heaven? And that's why Paul lists all this stuff out and says, look at this stuff. Look what I brought in that I had to deal with. And look at what we bring in that we have to deal with, right? So, some of the ideas that I think begin to bleed into our life with Christ. Let, let me outline them for you a little bit. First one is that you are what you do. You are what you do. I think, I think, that's, I think that's so prevalent in our culture and in our society today. You, you're judged and you're measured by what you do. Your, you, your value is in what you have. So we look to attain and to gain and to, and, and to retain and to keep and to continue to grow and, 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 and you know, invest and, and, and elevate. Another one is, is that the only way to get better is to work hard. I mean, listen, most of us would probably agree with some of these things in some ways. Like, yeah, like you got to work hard to get better. My point is, is that if you bring that, if you import that idea into your walk with God, you're hurting your relationship with Jesus. Because these ideas, these values, are, some of them don't actually, don't actually work with the cross of Christ. And so this idea right here, especially, that the only way to get better is to work hard. That's something that a lot of us walk with and have, have internalized and believe. And now it's bled over into our spiritual life. Another one, we control our own future. That's a, that's a pretty strong American idea, I think, for a lot of us. It's kind of the American dream, right? You control your own future. You, you as an individual are more important than the group that you belong to. See, this is, un this is actually uniquely American from a lot of other Eastern cultures. I, I, you know, I, I've actually got, um, uh, I'm, I'm half Hispanic, and so my whole Mexican side, my whole Hispanic side, like it's group culture actually. And a lot of Eastern and Asian uh, cultures are, are the same that way. Like group culture, the group is actually more important than the individual. I'm not saying one's better than the other. I'm just saying th these are the ideals and these are the values that we've internalized, and now we bring these things to our walk with Christ, and now we've got to figure out how do we navigate these? How do we make it healthy? How do we make it, how do we make it subject to the Word of God? Okay? N another one is competition, right? Americans are competitive. <laughs> Our culture, competition brings out the best in us or the worst, right? <clears throat> um, competition, though, like competition creates the best setting for the best to win. Makes you your best. Another value or ideal that we walk in with is don't waste time. Right? Don't waste time. On time, every time. Get there early. We, we, we don't waste time. And we're so consumed with not wasting time that we never make space to just be with God. Like, let, let me just show you why. Because you're like, well, that's not a bad thing. I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing. But what happens when it bleeds into our spiritual life? Look, we don't waste time. So we never settle into a relationship with Jesus. We never slow down and say, God, I'm just going to be with you. We never slow down and say, God, like, like, let me just enjoy who you are, your presence and your company. And so we're consumed with going, 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 living, living, living. Can't waste a moment. Can't waste a second. 
when God oftentimes just wants to relate and to be with us. That's just a quick example of how this can be, uh, uh, you know, counterproductive in our relationship with God. While don't waste time is probably a great thing at work, it may not be a great thing in your relationship with God. See, the problem comes in when we carry all of these things and they infect and we import them into our spiritual life. And here's the problem. We begin to use these ideas as, as a way to gain or maintain the approval of the culture around us, of the God that we serve, of the people that we walk alongside of. We, we, we think that, okay, if I can just keep all of these things up right, then I will have a good and successful life. It's, it's kind of like when, when, when people come over, okay? You have people come over. What do you do? You clean the house, Right? Okay, that, that's, that's what you do. You got a small group coming over, you got some people coming over, right? <clears throat> um, and, and you know, like for me, like the hour before people get there is pandemonium, right? I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's just chaos, okay? Like couches are flying everywhere, cushions, you know, you're, you're finding, you, you wash a window you didn't even know you had, you know? You're like this window's been here our whole life, like, where, you know? And you, like you're, you're on a hunt for every speck of dirt, Okay, as though people are going to come through with a white glove, right, and be like, oh, thank you so much for having us over. Let's see what this looks like. Oh, you know, like, <laughs> that's my expectation, you know. Um, and to be honest, probably before I was married, I was actually, you probably, it probably would have been terrible, honestly. I mean, <laughs> uh, probably making a, the mess worse the hour before you arrived. But uh, my wife has saved me. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, you, you know, and everyone's got that closet, right? You got that closet, you know, it's like, where does this go? The closet. Just get, put it in the closet. What about this thing? Put it in the closet. That's a child. Put it in the closet. You know, like. <laughs> and, so, and so for us, like for me, it's like, okay, got to get it clean enough. You know, in that last hour. And listen, my wife keeps an you know, incredible clean house. And, you know, I got to say that for sure. Um, and she does. It's true. But, um, <clears throat> you know, in that last hour, like I turn into like the, 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 the you know, the, the dirt finder. Anyways. Um, and so. And so it's, it's, we all stuff it in this closet, and it's like people come through, and it makes me feel good because you see I have a clean house. It makes me feel successful that, hey, everything's put together. Everything's nice and where it should be. But lurking in the home is that closet. And I'm hoping nobody opens that and sees all the junk. And it's the same is true for our spiritual life. See, see we, we spin and we work and we try to get all these things done. We try to be respectable. We try, we try to look a certain way. We try to hold all these things together. When internally, internally there's something going on. There's a closet deep inside of me. And I hope nobody opens that up. Because if they did, they'd see all the junk. They'd see all the, they'd see, they'd see all the messed up. They'd see all the stuff that I'm, 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 I'm really wishing that, that I could get rid of. But really, I'm not willing to confront it. And, and so we live that way. And when we, when we allow allow some of the cultural ideals to come into our life and to infect our spiritual life when we import them in, the danger, the danger is that we begin to rely on those things. We hope in those things. And that's what Paul's saying to us is, listen, listen, hope, hoping in the temporary, it may make you feel and appear that you have a good life, but it doesn't mean that you have a holy one. Hoping and trusting in, man, I've got all these things put together, Okay. I've got all this stuff right. Like I'm doing this thing, I'm doing that thing. Hoping and trusting and all that. It may, may, may look you and may make you feel like you have a good life. It may make it appear that you have a good life. But it doesn't mean that you have a holy one. And, and God is calling us. God calls his people not to a good life, but to, he says, be holy as I am holy. And, and so for us, we have, to, we have to stop and say, okay, what is my hope in I just told you about how, like, you know, I, I clean. The problem is I'm an attainer. I'm like Paul. I'm like, I'm an achiever. Like, I want to get stuff done. I want to do it. And it just, for me, it bleeds into everything. And so we've got to deal with that. And Paul had that same issue. And so what does he say to us? What should we do? Verse 7. Here's how Paul sees it all. Here's why he brings it all to the light. Because here's what it means to him now. Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. That, that word loss the actual meaning of it, if you translate it well from the original, it means the word dung, feces, excrement. Paul's saying it's, it's completely worthless. He says everything that I had, everything that I could have had is a loss without Christ. And so what I, the point I'm trying to bring to us today out of this scripture is that today in our culture, 
We can depend on things in this life to make us feel as though we are good enough. We can, make us, we can depend on things in life to make us think we don't need help. To make us think that I don't need saved. To make us think that I have it all together. See, all of us, no matter where you're at with God, you have an idea of what a good and what a successful life looks like. Like maybe for you it's financial stability. Like, man, as long as I'm financially stable, man, I'm good. Maybe for you it's, it's, it's esteem and respect from peers. You know, that's what we look at, man. Like, I'm, like, okay, I've got that, and so I feel good about my life because, you know, I'm valued at work. People respect me, and people think I do a good job. Maybe, you know, maybe it's, a, maybe it's the American dream. Maybe it's property and quality of life and standard of living. Okay, like, I've got a better car. I've got a nicer house. You know, I've, 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 I've got a good dog. It's, it's these things that, that can, that can um, take us away from what we should really be focused on. More, maybe it's more followers, more popularity, more likability. Man, if people just like, I'm just a likable, if I'm a likable person and people think that I'm, I'm, I'm good and, and they enjoy being around me, then that's a, that's a good and successful life. Maybe a, a good education and maybe being generous or, or, or helping people from time to time. Maybe, maybe, man, my kids attend church and so that's a win, right? And some days that is a win, okay? Um, Providing financial stability for my family or, 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 or maybe, you know, like I know scripture really well. Like, okay, like, so that's, that's how I feel good about myself. I know the word. I can quote doctrine. I know theology. Right? And I look to these things to make me feel good. about I worship. I serve. Okay? Like, like let's get into the church life. Like, like, I serve every week when they call me on my weeks off. Like, I still show up to serve and I wish they'd stop calling me, but they keep calling me. I lead a small group. Man, I raise my hands in worship. I, you know, I attend often. I attend consistently. I even watch when I'm on the boat, on the lake. I even watch on the live stream. And we look to those things and say, man, I feel good about my life. I'm, I'm successful as a Christian. Look at all these things that I do. And that's, that's not what a good and successful life is meant to look like. What Paul's saying is that all that stuff is a loss. Because listen, all that stuff is really temporary. Hope and temporary things will always leave you hopeless. Hope and temporary things will always leave you hopeless. That's why he says, I count it as loss for the sake of knowing Christ. Why? Because there's only one thing that doesn't leave me hopeless. And that's Jesus. And so hope and temporary things will always leave you hopeless. So for Paul, he's saying, listen, being an acceptable Roman citizen... Right, coming back to the context and the understanding of how they would have been listening. Being an acceptable Roman citizen, he's saying, that's a loss. Hey, listen, I get it. They're pressuring you. Like you're a new Christian. You're a convert. And they want you to live that way. But being, being an acceptable Roman citizen, that's a loss. Let go of those old values. Let go of those ideals. Let go of those ways of thinking. And he's even saying, you know what? It's a loss. Well, the, the, the new Jewish Christians who they're trying to convert you and make you do these things, that's a loss too to try and live in that old way and obey the Old Testament and, and, and live through all those old values. That's a loss, he's saying. And so today he says, listen, to be a, 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 a respectable American Christian who, who does all of these things and has all these ideals and, and looks all the part, that's a loss. What we have to do is look and say, okay, is my Christian, is, is my faith shaped by my beliefs about America, my systems, the things that I grew up in? Or have I allowed myself to really be shaped by God's word? Have I allowed my faith and my spirituality and my trust in Jesus to be, really be shaped by God's word? Or am I allowing it to be shaped by culture? Am I putting my hope in temporary things by saying, you know, I want a good and successful life, but good and successful looks like all these other things that the, that the world tells me. All these other things that, that maybe they, they're, they're a little bit different, but you know what? The, the, the value is just important. And it looks just a little bit different through the Christian lens. That's all it is. Yeah, it's it's don't, waste, you know, don't waste time. Well, you know, it's, it's just I'm always trying to be active for God. Right? So it's the, you see, it's the same thing. It's just... It's just filtered through the wrong lens. And now we're putting our hope and our faith in temporary things. And all these things that make us look good. We're trying to keep this clean house, but the closet is dirty. See, the problem is, the problem is when, when, you, when you put your, your hope in temporary things, it's hopeless. Because, because as Paul says in verse 8, look at this. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. 
For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. See, hope, is, hope in the temporary is hopeless because, listen, you'll, you're trying to be good enough and you'll never know if you'll be good enough. Like you're trying to, okay, I've got this thing good, I've got this thing, I've got more stuff good than I've got bad, so I'm good enough. The problem is you'll never know if you're good enough. And that's why it's hopeless. It's, it's like going to school and not knowing your grades along the way. It's like turning in a homework assignment and then like you don't get to know how you did on it. Right? And then you do a test and you don't, you don't get to know whether you failed or passed, whether you, you know, you got a C or D. And some of you, like that's how you live through school anyway, right? You're like, ah, oh, just, yeah, <laughs> Eh, there's the stuff. Tell me about it at the end of the year if I made it. Can I walk? No? Okay, we'll try it again next year. Um, third time's a charm, you know. Um, and uh, imagine the hope, like imagine the frustration, the hopeless state you'd be in, just like, I don't know if I'm passing, I don't know if I'm failing, I don't know where I'm at with this. That's how so many of us live our Christian life. Because we're putting our hope in trying to attain these, these things. We're putting our hope in trying to live up to standards from the world around us, from the culture around us, from the ideas that we imported in, and not putting our hope in Jesus and Jesus alone. And so, and so this is what Paul says to us. He says, listen, listen, everything is lost. Everything is lost. The only thing that, the only righteousness comes through faith in Christ. Only comes from God that depends on faith. And so, so when we put our hope in God, we get to know him better. We allow him to touch our heart. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, it says, And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. Listen, understand this. He works in us. You've got to get this. He works in us so that you will love him more. God wants you to love him more. That, that's, that's, why, that's why he did the work that he did. That's why he speaks to you, and that's, that's why his word is for us, and, and, and that's why, that's why the, the work of the cross happened, so that we can love him more. And so many of us think that, that we're going to do more for him. No, 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 you're just, you're just going to love him more. If you would step into that, then everything else would begin to fall into place. But we're living, spinning, looking for temporary things, chasing all these other things that the world would throw at us, the world says is valuable, that we've, we've imported these ideas into. And, and, and Paul is just saying, listen, 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 don't forget to remember Jesus. See, listen, listen. God just wants you to love him more. So don't forget to remember Jesus. Paul says this in, in verse 10. He says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. See, there is such joy in knowing God. There's such joy in knowing God a compassionate, loving, kind Father who loves you. And here's the thing, guys. One day, in eternity, when you're face to face with him, listen, he's, he's not gonna ask. The first question he's gonna ask is not, I mean, did you do all that stuff? Did you take care of all those things? He's not gonna ask, were you a great husband? Did you? Love your kids and all that stuff's important. Like, I want to be a good husband. I want, you know, I want you to be a, a good husband, a good dad, a good mom. The first thing that he's going to ask us, though, is did you know me? Did you know me? Because all the stuff that you can do for God doesn't matter if you didn't know him. All the stuff that you can try and execute, it doesn't matter if you don't know him. And he wants to know you deeply. One day he'll look right at you with compassion and love and yearning and, and just say, man, did you know me? Because I wanted to know you. Because I love you. And so for us, we have to not forget, we have to not forget to remember Jesus. See in that little passage in verse 10 and 11, you can dig into this later on your own, because I'm, I'm running out of time, but there's, there's two key points that I can pull out of that. The purpose and the process out of verses 10 and verse 11. See, the purpose 
is that we would become like Jesus. The reason that we put our hope and we put our trust and that we work all into this stuff, that, that we settle ourselves in this, is that we could become more like him. And inward, this phrase, you can go dig into it, it means an inward, that this um, being transformed, uh, sharing his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that phrase right there, it's an inward transformation that becomes apparent outwardly. It's, it's not something on the outside that goes in. It's something on the inside that moves out. See, the temporary things, they can't touch the heart. And so, and so God has for us a process. The purpose becoming like him, the process is the suffering. He says there to share in his sufferings. Understand this, that Christ died to himself. He became like us so we could become like him by dying to ourselves. This is, this is, a, this is a, a strange thought for us. But think about this. Paul is saying, like, you become like him through the process of suffering. So we have to put, we have to bring suffering on ourselves. And I'm not talking about self-harm here. I'm not talking about hurtful things physically in any way like that. I'm talking about the same way that Christ emptied himself in Philippians 2.7. It says that, so, that, so he did, he did not, he, he, he emptied himself. But emptying himself by taking the form of a servant and becoming the likeness in the form of man. Christ literally, he said, you know what? I can keep all of these things or I can empty myself and step down and humble myself. And so he emptied himself of, of all of his power. He emptied himself of all of his, 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 his this, and it's, it's really deep, try to understand it, but this, this Godhead that he had and, and he became like man and, and he emptied himself of all, all these attributes. He, he emptied himself and let go of all these things that he could have held on to. And that's what Paul is calling us to do. When he says, sharing his sufferings, he's saying, empty yourself. Let go of all the things that you want to hold on to. Let go of all of the ideas, all of the dreams, all of the passions, all the stuff that makes you feel good and feel like you're successful, all the stuff that makes you feel like you're hitting it right and, and you've got the Christian life and you're doing everything you're supposed to be doing, all that stuff that makes you feel like I'm good enough, let go of it because you'll never know if you're good enough. And if you would just empty yourself, if you would empty yourself of, of the, the Americanized form of these ideas that have begun to bleed into your Christian life, every culture's got to do it. Every culture's got to face it. We just have some unique ones to us. But we've got to deal with them. We've got to begin to empty ourselves so that we can become like Him. Because that's the goal. So the question, the question today in summary that I want to end with is just simply this. What must you lose so that you can gain? What must you lose so that you can gain? Verse 12, it says this, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. See, I love this thought. That this, this is, this is what Paul leaves us with. Listen, you are his. You are his. He's saying, listen, all that stuff that makes you feel good, all that stuff that makes you feel like you have it all together, all that stuff that, that, that you're relying on, it's temporary. There's only one thing to put your hope in. And that's that you are his, that he loves you. That he's, he's taken you in, he's adopted you. This is the cry of a man who's already walked with God. And he's saying, I want to know God more. And so my question is, church, where is our cry to know God more? Where is our cry to say, God, I need more of you. We cry out for more of the temporary. We cry out for more of success. We cry out for more attainment. We cry out for more achievement. We cry out for more entertainment. We cry out for more money. We cry out for more stability. We cry out for more comfort. But where is our cry to know God more? Because if we would cry out for that, man, he would step into that. We would experience him. We would walk with him. That cry comes through us emptying ourselves. What must you lose? What must you lose so that you can gain? Jim Elliott says, he is no fool who gives up that which he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Man, there's nothing worth holding on to. There's nothing worth holding on to that is greater than the love of Christ. You are his own.
just ask you to just sit in that, remember that today, that we are his. And because of that, we don't got to be good enough. We don't got to put our hope in all these other things. I can let go of all these ideas, all these values, all these other things, and just step into a knowledge and a love of God. Let me pray for you today, if you would, bow your head. Just to allow us a moment of private reflection. Just ask you to think for a second. Where's my hope? Is my hope in temporary things? Just privately, but just between you and God, just ask God right now, God, to, to reveal, God, is, is there things that, that I need to let go? Some things that nobody knows, some, some ways that I validate myself that, that nobody sees, things that I put my trust in that, that I need to release at work, at home, with my family, my money, my finances, and my church attempt. What, what is it? Just allow God to speak to you right now. What do you need to lose so that you can gain? Father, we love you. God, we thank you that you love us, that you made us your own. God, help us to walk with that today. Help us to remember God, that in losing everything, God, we gain everything. God, help us to make those hard choices. God, help us to look inward, to do the work that only you can do in us, Lord. To let go of the temporary and grab onto you. We thank you for your word and your love in us. We trust in you, in Jesus' name.